I guess it must be family now, no introduction, right? So, good morning. Good morning. Such a treat to be with you this morning, and uh, thank you for welcoming me into your family, but uh, also reminding, who do I give this to? This put it right here. The, uh, that we're all part of the same family, right? I just live in a different part of the, of the country and, and worship with a different branch of the family, but uh, we are all one family, and thank you for that beautiful anthem. Our choir sings that, but maybe not as well. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Hope there's nobody from First Press Houston watching online. The, uh, uh, it's been a great week of connecting with some uh, some friends from Houston. In fact, I played golf with a member of First Press Houston uh, the other day and uh, got to know him for the first time, even though we've been at the same church together for 10 years. So, uh, And then uh, just checking in with some other friends and even had the opportunity to go down Monday and Tuesday and see my daughter and her family and to, uh, uh, to invade the in-law space, right? If you're a grandparent, you know, you kind of jealously guard your territory. And here were the, here were the other grandparents coming in on, and interloping. So uh, anyway, also had a chance to check in on Pastor Tim, who is working on his project and uh, has made great progress on that. So I can report that back to you, that uh, when he returns next uh, Sunday, he will have made significant progress on finishing off his uh, doctoral work. And, you know, as I said last week, Tim pleaded with me to preach on tithing and sacrificial giving. <laughs> but I told him that I didn't think that that was really appropriate, that what I would, wanted to do was kind of look at the book of Acts and uh, just talk a little bit about what it looks like to be in this amazing adventure together as members of the family, to, to take a look at some of the... Uh, of the saints of the past to uh, encourage us uh, as we live our lives in partnership with Christ uh, as saints in the present day. So we're going to look this morning at uh, chapter 11 in the book of Acts, and I'm going to read uh, verses 19 through 26. So if you would stand and join me, uh, I'd like to read God's word to you. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus, to look for Saul, whom we know as Paul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So, Lord... As we gather around your word this morning, Holy Spirit, would you open it to us? Would you open our ears and our minds? Would you open our hearts that we would receive the word that you have for each of us, whether that be a word of comfort, a word of encouragement, or simply just a word of deeper understanding as we understand this great adventure that you have called us into. So open your word to us this morning, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. So, of course, the book of Acts, if you are not familiar with it, is the story of the birth and the early chapters in the history of the church. And uh, it starts with uh, the church in Jerusalem, where it is given birth to. And, but it eventually shifts north up into Antioch, 
And instead of following Peter, as it does at the beginning, Peter and John anyway, the attention shifts to Paul as Paul begins then to move across the Roman Empire, sharing the gospel uh, wherever he goes. And I mentioned that, again, I'm assuming most of you know that, but I want to just kind of get our heads back into an understanding of what the book of Acts is really all about, and to remind us that it's a story about a movement, okay? Christianity in that day was a movement. It was initiated and empowered by the Holy Spirit, but it was accomplished through the lives of ordinary people. We're used to associating church with buildings and institutions and programs and ministries and activities, but we need to be reminded from time to time that the church was and remains a movement, a movement designed to to share and to serve and to, to proclaim the gospel through our ordinary daily lives. Now, we say this from time to time at at First Pres Houston. It's certainly not original to us, but uh, it's important to remind ourselves that we don't go to church, right? We are the church. We're the church whether we are in the building or whether we are in the city. We don't go to church. We are the church. So as you look at those first couple of verses there, it refers back to something that I I mentioned last week as well, this great persecution of the church, right, that uh, was associated with Stephen, the first martyr who lost his life for the church, and after that, the leaders of uh, of Judaism in Jerusalem say, we have got to get rid of this movement. And so they scatter the church, and with the exception of the apostles, everyone gets out of Dodge, most of them moving north, but some of them going to Judea and Samaria. And what takes place is one of the most extraordinary stories of evangelism that we will ever encounter. Oh, it wasn't a strategy. It wasn't as if they all plotted and said, okay, you go here, and you go here, and you go here, and we'll all carry the gospel wherever we go. This was just a bunch of people, refugees, really, safety, seeking the opportunity to live. But in the process, they couldn't help but carry the gospel wherever they went. The Jewish leaders took the gospel to Jewish people. The Greeks, however, some Greek believers who had come to know the Lord, they were from Cyprus and from North Africa. They decided to take the gospel to the Greeks. And uh, five to seven years after this terrible persecution, we get the first new church plant in Scripture, a church comprised both of Jews and Gentiles, or Jews and Greeks, This is the very church that sends Paul and Barnabas and others out on their missionary journeys across the Roman Empire, which then gives us the balance of the book of Acts and most of the New Testament outside of the Gospels. Now, I don't know whether you are struggling with this here in Carmel, but uh, there's a lot of conversation in Houston, uh, at First Houston, about the peril that we find the church in today. The church, at least in, the, in America, is struggling, isn't it? And there's a lot of us that have a great deal of concern about the state of the church in the U.S., about the divisions that we are seeing or experiencing, about false teaching that uh, is coming from different directions, about where are all the young people, right? Right? And is there, you know, a significant generational change taking place that that's spells doom for the church? And is just the, the secularization of our culture, is it, is it going to continue to, to cramp and to, to uh, diminish our ability to be the church? And I think it's important for us to look at a book like the book of Acts and be reminded that over the course of history, friends, the church has always been in peril. Amen? 
The church has always been just that far, right, from going under. But at the same time, the church has never been in true peril because the church is in the hands of Jesus Christ. And it says that the darkness will never overcome him. And so what is our role then in that challenge, right? Well, our role is the same role that the people had back in Paul's day. It's to be faithful and to share the gospel as we can. And to remember, yeah, the church is, have, is, the church is currently experiencing challenges. But it has always experienced challenges. And it has always been in the hands of God. The greatest trials that the church has ever faced have always resulted in the greatest advances in the gospel. Anybody want to uh, uh, offer the uh, name of the, fast, or the area where the church is growing the fastest in the world right now? Iran. If you can believe that. The, the exponential church, the exponential growth of the church in Iran, right? It's just evidence that whenever the church is in peril, okay, and actually, whenever the culture is in crisis, is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work through people and expand the gospel. So the first lesson that I, I, I want to just remind us of from this text is that there's always two dimensions to history. <laughs> and the most important dimension is the idea that a sovereign God is guiding his people toward his purposes, even when it doesn't feel like he is. And then the second dimension is God's faithful people living as, faithful as they, faithfully as they can on mission, but sharing the gospel as they share their lives. As we talked last week, when ordinary people live faithfully in participation with an extraordinary God, amazing things happen. Or again, if I may, to put it in your context as you uh, work with this new uh, vision and mission statement, when people connected to Christ engage in small acts of great love, things can happen. First lesson, our role is to be faithful in sharing the gospel. Second lesson, second lesson comes to us in the form of a person. Barnabas, right? Whose very name, as, as most of you probably know, whether he was named or nicknamed son of encouragement, Barnabas, right? Wouldn't it be great to go through life with that? Jim, son of encouragement. And then to have the ability to, to live into that name. And he was. If you look at his life, the very small window into his life that we are given in Scripture, that's exactly who he was. Now, he's often presented as the patron saint of sacrificial giving. He's trotted out every year at stewardship season um, because he sold a field and he gave it to the church and allowed the church to, to serve in, in community. So you can tell Tim, I brought up sacrificial giving. <laughs> but actually, what I love about Barnabas is he's the personification, personification, not just of sacrificial giving, but of sacrificial living. Barnabas is just one of those people who's completely generous in spirit. We don't know much about him, but in verse 24, it says he was known for goodness, he was full of the Holy Spirit, and he was full of faith. And as I look at his life, I look at the idea that, first of all, obviously he was full of faith in Jesus Christ, but he was also full of faith in his ability to see Jesus Christ in others. He had faith in God's ability to do great things in the lives of ordinary people. And we don't think about Barnabas a lot. Well, we don't think about Barnabas much at all in the church today. But when we think about Barnabas, we don't really think about the fact that if it hadn't been for Barnabas, we probably wouldn't have had the Apostle Paul. Okay? If you go back in chapter 9 in the book of Acts, Paul has come, he's had this amazing conversion experience that nobody wants to believe and nobody wants him around because they're all judging him on the basis of his past life. And he can't get an audience with the other apostles. Who's the one that gets him in the door? Barnabas. Okay. Barnabas is sent by the church in Jerusalem by headquarters. They hear about this 
unauthorized church plant down in Antioch, or up in Antioch, I should say. So they send Barnabas to check it out. Barnabas spends some time there, and he goes, wow, this is a church full of Gentiles and Greek-speaking people. I wonder who might be effective in speaking to them. And he goes to Tarsus, and he brings Paul back. And then eventually Barnabas is going to go out in mission with Paul. And so it's probably an overstatement, but that's what we pastors do. I don't think we would have anywhere near the understanding of the Apostle Paul if Barnabas wasn't willing to be used by God to be an encouragement to Paul and to others. So that's our second lesson is the power of being an encourager. And I'll just invite you to take a minute. I was doing it earlier this week just to think about the encouragers in your life. I pray that you've had them, and I just invite you to think about them for a minute. The people that called out the potential that they saw in you. Individuals that could see into you more than you necessarily could see into yourself. You know, I've had... uh, And as you do that, just maybe make a mental note to give them a word of thanks. I got to thinking this week, uh, I had the opportunity to have lunch with a person that was an encourager in my life, and uh, uh, probably in ways that that he didn't even know uh, until I I brought them up at lunch. But it got me thinking about all of, (coughs) excuse me, all of the people that I have been blessed with in my life who have seen something more in me that I have seen in myself. And I could drop a lot of names for you because I've been a part of the Presbyterian Church for 30 years and I, I, I did all of my uh, uh, Masters of Divinity and doctoral work at Fuller. But you know the guy that was the greatest encouragement to me? It was a guy by the name of Bill Rippey. He was just a guy. He didn't have 17 degrees. Uh, He wasn't the pastor of a large church in Los Angeles, right? He didn't have all kinds of theological training. He was just the small group leader in the, the new members class that I timidly went into as somebody who was thinking, is this where I'm supposed to be? And he could tell that on the one hand, I wanted to be there, but on the other hand, I didn't really want to be there. And Bill Rippey just kind of walked alongside me for that entire process of coming to Christ. And I've never been able to find him again. That's why I mentioned most of the people that I, you know, have touched my life, I won't mention. But I mentioned Bill Rippey anywhere I preach because I'm hoping one day the Lord will reconnect us. I cannot find this guy. But he needs to know that as much as Don Muma, whom some of you knew, uh, or Dallas Willard, or any of those folks who have, have played a role in my life, Bill Rippey was a great encourager. So think about the people that have encouraged you in life and make a note to thank them. And then, but also ask your quest, yourselves this question, who am I encouraging? Who am I investing in? Who can I perhaps mentor or disciple or coach or just simply walk alongside of? And you know the great thing about encouragement is we can do that at any age and state. So, second lesson, be encouragers. The third lesson is found not so much in who Barnabas was, but rather in what Barnabas did as he invested in others. Look again at at verse 23. It says that Barnabas encouraged the faith of the believers. And then in verse 26, he said, along with Paul, he taught the church. In other words, Paul and Barnabas were engaged in the process of making disciples, of intentionally teaching people about Jesus, not just the stories of Jesus, but the character of Jesus, the example of Jesus, and how to apply the life of Jesus into their own life. And it's a reminder to us, or it's a reminder to me anyway, that faith is not just believing. Excuse me. Faith is not just even surrendering our lives and and receiving forgiveness of sin. But faith is choosing, choosing to learn to live as a disciple, to know the teaching of Christ, but also to apply the teaching of Christ into our daily lives. And I know you know this. We just need to all be reminded of it. 
That's why we come together on Sunday mornings, right? To worship God, to be reminded of who we are, and to be reminded that we're to carry who we are out into the world. Choosing to learn to live as disciples. You know, one of the most remarkable statements that Jesus made is recorded in Matthew 11, where he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and what? Heavy laden, right? Anybody feel weary or heavy laden today? And what does he say? I will give you rest. But then what does he say? He says, come and learn from me. He doesn't just say, hey, just hang out and rest for the rest of your life with me. He says, come and learn from me for my yoke, my teaching, my partnership with you is easy, right? And I am gentle of soul. And so essentially what he's saying is, yes, please come and find rest in me, but come and learn from me how to apply my teaching in your life, right? Jesus was a rabbi. What rabbis did is they invited people to follow them and to learn from them by observing, learn by doing. In other words, they followed Jesus to learn how to be like Jesus. And that's what he's saying to us. Learn from me how to be like me in the life that God has given you. You know, it's one thing to know that Jesus taught that we are to forgive generously. It's another thing to try to forgive generously, right, and end up forgiving grudgingly. It's another thing entirely to believe that we will find the life that we were created to live as we forgive generously. To live, the, to live a life infused, right, with the life of Jesus, to wherein forgiving generously, well, that's just what we do. That's just who we are as followers of Christ. I believe with all my heart as a member of the Reformed tradition that uh, our faith is a gift from God, right? We receive our faith. But at the same time, I also believe that faith is something that we learn as we practice it. Come and learn from me how to be like me, says Jesus. And we have to have both. And the temptation that we have in the church today, probably not in this church, but the temptation that we have in the church back in Houston is we have this tendency to look at the idea of discipleship as something that's reserved for the weird people. Right? For the people that are like really into it, the Mother Teresas of the world, the super serious. But we're all called to learn to receive, to be discipled, because it's in the discipleship process that we receive the life that Christ says we were created to receive. So for lesson one, the idea of being faithful. Lesson two, the idea of being an encourager. Lesson three, being willing to be discipled and to make disciples. And then the final lesson is directly related to the first, and it's actually my favorite lesson from this whole passage. Verse 20, who planted the church in Antioch? We don't know. It just says some of them. Some of them, not Peter, not James, not Paul, not Barnabas, not one of the apostles, not somebody whose name is forever in Scripture. Some of them, nameless people who loved Jesus, ordinary people, started that church. It was not uncommon in that day for the apostles to speak in Jewish synagogues or in public places, but most of the evangelism in that day most of the sharing of the good news took place in interpersonal relationships, in families, right? Social networks, in guilds, which was their version of professional networks, in the marketplace on a daily basis. I think it was Tim Keller gave them the title Marketplace Missionaries. They didn't have an evangelism strategy they didn't set out from Jerusalem to plant a church. They just were 
ordinary folks living faithfully who couldn't stop talking about Jesus. And the Lord used that to plant this amazing church. And friends, we don't ever think about it in this context, but this church, the church that I currently pastor, and every church has its roots all carry all the way back to this church in Antioch, right? And before that, the church in Jerusalem. But this church in Antioch planted by a bunch of no-name people who just couldn't stop talking about Jesus. What did they share? Well, the text makes it quite clear. They shared the gospel, but historians will tell us that they also lived the gospel. They shared a message of radical hope and assurance They were able to say to folks who were sacrificing to idols, who just demanded more and more and more, what if you put your faith in a God who sacrificed himself for you? Now, friends, is that not a a message that our culture needs to hear today? Whatever the idols are that we are sacrificing for, who just demand more and more and more, wouldn't it be so much nicer to put at the center of our lives the one who sacrificed himself for us. They lived by radically different values. They practiced radical care of their neighbors, of of the community. In short, they carried the gospel as they lived the gospel. And in the process, they made the love of Jesus real. I think it's amazing, and this a whole nother sermon for a whole nother Sunday, but it's amazing. The church in that day didn't know anything about evangelism. They didn't have any evangelism strategies. They just went out and talked about Jesus and then lived the life that Jesus called them to live. And the Lord used them to start this church and then that church and then another church and to leave us with this incredible legacy that we live with today. Well, what might this mean for us as we close? You already know this, but I'll say it anyway. Current research says that the most effective way to share the gospel is to bring people into some church and let them hear great preaching. No, not true. Absolutely not true. 90% of people who come to faith come to faith through you. Come to faith because of a friend who either shared the gospel with them personally or connected them with someone else who could share the gospel with them. A friend, a family member intentionally sharing their faith. And so here we find ourselves in 2021 with exactly the same formula available to us that was used to plant this incredible church in Antioch. Ordinary people living out their faith, sharing their lives, and in the process, sharing their faith. So the second part of your mission statement, small acts of great love. Anybody know who is credited with saying that the first time? not Tim Yee. It's not the elder of of, uh, discipleship. It's Mother Teresa. Did you know that? Mother Teresa, uh, I think she said, we're not called to do great things. We're called to do small things with great love. And you know, when we talk about discipleship in the church, we have a tendency to focus on the Mother Teresa. We have a tendency to focus on the Hall of Famers. But I always like to remind people that Mother Teresa It was just an ordinary young woman named Agnes who had a desire to live faithfully for God. And in the process of living faithfully for God, the Lord gave her the life that he wanted to give her, that he created her for, and raised her up to a place. That was the gospel according to Mother Teresa. Imagine what Jesus wants to do with the gospel according to you. In his name and for his sake.
Would you join me in prayer? Lord, would you reignite or fan again our passion for you? I know it exists in this church because this church does amazing things in your name. But would you fan again in each of us a love for you that comes out of your love for us that we might be known in that same way? as people who just can't stop talking about Jesus. And then, Lord, would you give us the courage to trust you with all the rest of it as we seek to be people who love you, as we seek to be people who invite others into a life with you, as we seek to be encouragers, as we seek to, to train, disciple, coach, mentor, that we may all grow up in the faith that we all might encourage someone else to grow up in the faith so that they could go out and do nothing more than talk about Jesus. Would you help us to be those people we pray in your name? Amen.